Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and thank you for being here tonight at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm the Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, and thank you for being here on the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. Mr. President, welcome. It's our very, very great honor to have you here. Before I give the formal introduction, I do want to acknowledge the extraordinary group of distinguished guests that are here in the audience. There are several senior members and ministers from the Filipino government. Thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the Institute of Politics and the Office of the University Marshal for all of your work. Now, the Philippines is a nation of exceptional scope and beauty and diversity. Indeed, I suspect this is not news to anyone in this audience. Uh, it's a nation that consists of more than 7,000 islands. And indeed, for any of us that have trouble with 50 states, this notion is extremely uh, uh, remarkable. Um, it has fascinating landscapes, active volcanoes, splendid beaches, coral waters, tropical forests. And it's uh, 92 million people are obviously rich in culture and history and industry. Um, it's, a nature, it's a nation with a complex history uh, of invasion, colonization, independence, authoritarian rule, and democracy. It's a nation that has to deal with not only foreign challenges, but natural ones. Most importantly, it's a nation with a history of courage and progress in the face of adversity. Our speaker tonight comes from a family dedicated to serving the people of the Philippines. He's a fourth generation pol uh, politician and the only son of democracy icons, Sen uh, Senator Benigno Ninoy Aquino and President Corazon Aquino. Such a prominent heritage can lead in many directions, but throughout his life, Noi Noi Aquino, as he is commonly referred to, has chosen a life of service and leadership. He served as a representative of the second district of Tarlac from 1998 to 2007, working to pass a number of bills and resolutions to uphold public accountability and address the people's pressing problems. In May 2007, he joined the Philippine Senate where he worked about, to bring about legislative initiatives anchored on the protection of human rights and honest and responsible governance. He is also capable of reaching across the political divide, something that, by the way, we could learn from in this country. In one memorable case, Aquino reached out to his former enemy, uh, Senator jo uh, Gregio um, Hanasa. Hanasa, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and he, he was supporting his uh, application for bail. Um, Aquino told uh, Jab Tabawa of uh, Sedu Daily News on March 5th, 2007, um, I endorse Hanasan's request for bail uh, to even out the playing field. I was hit five bullets from Hanasan's men in the neck and the hips, but that's past now. The principle of my father was respect the rights of your enemies. This is what defines democracy. Genuine reconciliation is democracy in action. Indeed, um, in 2009, he lost his mother, President Corazon Aquino, to cancer. And 40 days later, uh, after her passing, he officially announced his candidacy for the presidency in the same location where his mother took the oath of office on the final day of the EDSA P uh, People Power Revolution. At the time, he stated, I want to make democracy work, not just for the rich and well-connected, but for everybody. Uh, you could not find finer words to express the goals of President Kennedy and the Kennedy School of Government. In his, June inaugural, in his inaugural address in June, he told the Filipino people, we are here to serve and not to lord over you. The mandate given me was one of change. I accept your marching orders to transform our government from one that is self-serving to one that works for the welfare of the nation. Now the economy is transitioning from an economy based on agriculture to one based more on services and manufacturing. This has been a time of unprecedented economic growth in the years 2012 and 2013, the Philippines posted a high GDP growth, reaching 6.8% in 2012, 7.2% in 2013, the highest GDP growth rates in Asia for the first two quarters of 2013. That is quite an accomplishment. Uh, the president sought to improve governmental services, reform the education system, provide conditional transfers to the poor, prosecute corrupt and abusive uh, government officials. Nona Aquino was given the St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Medal in 2010, quote, 
for his commitment to democracy, advocacy of the poor, opposition to corruption, and promotion of peaceful change in the Philippines. There is strong hope for the future. But many challenges remain, from accountability to education, from disputes with China and North China Sea to unemployment and poverty. Tensions and violence remain with ethnic and some religious tensions. And, uh, and we all watched in horror by the de at the devastation caused by uh, Typhoon Haiyan. Much has been accomplished in the recovery. Private businessmen in the Philippines have boosted their efforts to rebuild areas devastated last year uh, through their social investments and the recovery is ongoing. Uh, the effort was worldwide and I was very proud when the Filipino community here at the Kennedy School and Southeast Asia Caucus and others came together at Harvard to support relief efforts and do our modest bit for that, for that uh, to advance that effort. As the 15th President of the Republic of the Philippines, President Aquino wants to stand for Filipinos, reinvigorated passion to build the a nation of justice, peace, and inclusive progress. Please join me in welcoming President Benigno Aquino. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dean David Elwood, Ms. Maggie Williams, Secretary Albert de Rosario of our Foreign Affairs Department, members of the cabinet present, Ambassador Joey Quisha, Consul General Mario de Leon, students, fellows, faculty, and staff from Harvard, or is it still Harvard? <laughs> ha I'm sorry, I lost the accent 31 years ago. <laughs> but I still know how to pack the car. <laughs> <laughs> members of the local community aren't guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As some of you may know, Boston was home to me for about two and a half years. It was here that my family found warmth in exile during the dark days of the Marcos dictatorship. Harvard, in particular, was a haven for my father, who was one of your visiting fellows during those years. Back then, however, the closest I ever got to entering Harvard was traveling along Massachusetts Avenue. I never even owned a shirt from your souvenir store. <laughs> now I'm here talking to you, and I hope that later the organizers who invited me will be patting themselves on the back instead of shaking their heads in dismay. As a young man, I was taught that not opposing an oppressive structure was tantamount to perpetuating it. If you recognize a problem and choose not to do anything about it, then you become complicit, and in fact, you even exacerbate it. This reminds me of something that President John F. Kennedy once said, and then may I quote, other people see things and say, why? But I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? I take the difference to be in how people respond to being dissatisfied with the status quo. Anything made by the imperfect being that is man is by nature imperfect as well. The natural course, therefore, is to continue bettering the situation, to continue challenging the status quo so it can be changed for the better. But sadly, there are those who think that that's the way things are. There's nothing you can do about the status quo. Others, though, Think in terms of positive transformation. If things are wrong, why not change it? This refusal to settle for the status quo played a pivotal role many times in the history of my country. It was in 1972 when Ferdinand Marcos, approaching the end of his second and last term, tried to float the idea of being replaced by his wife Imelda. When that did not pan out, he tried to push for a shift to a parliamentary government with no term limits. However, the political process for constitutional change stalled, and the 1973 elections were fast approaching. At that dead end, Mr. Marcos declared martial law. My father, a senator in those days, was perhaps the fiercest fiscalizer of Mr. Marcos, in conformity with the concept of checks and balances in government. For this, he was put on top of Mr. Marcos's order of battle. When martial law was proclaimed, my father was jailed for seven years and seven months for the most part, in solitary confinement. He was, however, allowed to leave for the United States to undergo a coronary bypass. He brought his family with him to live in exile here in Boston for about three years. As late as 1983, even with the Gandhian example of nonviolence toppling a colonial regime, a lot of people still believed that it was only through violence that freedom can be won. I must admit, that back then I was also of that disposition. 
In furtherance of his belief that the non-violent route would be most beneficial for our countrymen, my father returned to the Philippines despite the many concerns about his safety. He was hoping that even out of mere curiosity, Mr. Marcos would agree to have a dialogue with him. My father hoped to relate to him the true situation of the country, that is, more and more of our people were becoming disillusioned with the dictatorship. More and more were turning towards militancy, and the risk of civil war was increasing. My father feared the dictator was detached from reality. He was, after all, surrounded by cronies and flatterers who would tell him only what he wanted to hear. This dialogue was not to be. My father was assassinated while alighting from his plane in Manila. His death reawakened the Filipino people. In three years, they would bring the dictatorship down in the bloodless EDSA People Power Revolution. How did they do it? Not by settling for and accepting the way things are, but by dreaming and acting on that dream. When people clamored for my mother to lead them, she set down two conditions. First, that the million signatures be gathered in support of her candidacy. And second, that there should be snap elections. When Mr. Marcos, in his hubris, felt undefeatable and called for snap elections, he scoffed that my mother, a so-called mere housewife, without any experience in government, could never run the country. My mother responded by saying, and I quote, I admit, I have no experience in cheating, stealing, lying, or assassinating political opponents. Mr. Marcos assumed that regardless of how the Filipino people voted, he could rig the results. Little did he realize the Filipino people would dare to dream and confront every act of fraud and intimidation with solidarity and vigilance at the polls. In EDSA, the major thoroughfare bisecting our national capital region, my people responded to tanks and machine guns with flowers, prayers, and songs. They dared to believe that the ultimate loyalty of our soldiers would be to their fellow Filipinos and not to the tyrant. When we regained our freedom, there was a popular song that said that we will never allow the aberration that was martial law to happen again. And starting in 2001, however, my predecessor, instead of learning the lessons of martial law, seemingly adopted Mr. Marcos's handbook on how to abuse the democratic process. At the end of a regime, our people were so apathetic to all the scandals and issues affecting her and government's inability to effect change that the overwhelming ambition of so many was to leave the country. We have now an estimated 10 million of our countrymen, 10% of the population residing and working abroad. In 2010, our aspirations were summed up in a campaign slogan, eliminating corruption would eliminate poverty. To do so, we'd, we, we would make right all our systems and institutions that were so wrongly tarnished and abused. Our people dared to dream and acted on that dream by entrusting to me a mandate to undo the corrupt, broken down government that Filipinos had once accepted as the norm and thus turn it into an effective and efficient government working to uplift the country. Allow, with, allow me to share with you four case studies of how we are fulfilling our mandate for change and how it was ignited or how it has ignited a virtuous cycle in our country. The first two cases revolve around two individuals, a young woman I met during my campaign for the presidency and a former chief justice for our country being held to account by means of impeachment. The young woman I speak of at age 16 had just given birth to her second child. She had little in terms of resources or education and was in a relationship where both she and her partner, not that much older than her, had very little in terms of job prospects. Add to this the fact that there were very few support mechanisms to help them raise their children. At a very tender age, all the problems in the world were hers, and I had to wonder what would be the future for children who were born in such deprived conditions. The odds were stacked against them from the very beginning. Consider this. If a nation's greatest resource is its people, then it is the state's obligation to invest in the people, to give them a fighting chance to improve their lot in life. The young woman I met convinced me that we must enact, amongst other legislation, one that provides access to information about reproductive health while respecting the conscience of the individual. We accomplished this through intense public debate and a conscience vote in Congress. 
We also undertook programs that allocated our limited resources to where they could have the most impact at the soonest possible time. For example, we have a conditional cash transfer program which now provides regular cash grants to 4.1 million poor households who commit in turn to have regular health checkups for pregnant mothers, among other conditions, and to having their children vaccinated, but most importantly, keeping them in school. Investing in the well-being of the people is the surest way to ensure that no one will be left behind. The conditional cash transfer does this on the most basic level, but we are all aware that as with all other challenges, our approach in fighting poverty must be multifaceted. This is why we have closed critical resource gaps in education, such as classrooms, books, and school seats, while expanding our basic education to put it at par with international standards. Our Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, or TESDA, today partners with the private sector to ensure that training programs produce employable graduates. We continue to work to reduce Filipinos' vulnerabilities to calamities by improving weather forecasting and flood mapping systems and even construction standards, and by fostering greater coordination amongst agencies. These are only few, or only a few examples of the measures we have taken, all of which empower Filipinos and show them that ours is a government that will always stand behind them and beside them. This brings me to my second example, involving an individual at the pinnacle of his career. My predecessor who put a premium on political survival tried to protect herself by appointing a chief justice to the Supreme Court, despite a prohibition on appointing people to office when a presidency is about to end. Much as I oppose this, for the sake of harmony, I tried to make the best of a sordid situation. It soon became clear, however, that the chief justice considered himself accountable to no one, failing even to meet the minimum standards of transparency outlined on our laws. To illustrate, as a measure towards transparency, our constitution requires government workers and officials to declare their wealth in a signed statement of assets, liabilities, and net worth. He declared that a mere, he, the Chief Justice, declared a mere 2% of his wealth, hiding the rest in an apparent attempt to mislead the public. We resolved to stop this impunity. Our House of Representatives impeached him for violating the Constitution and betraying public trust. The Senate later convicted him. His dismissal from office and the charges he now faces in the regular courts is just one example of accountability. My predecessor and three incumbent senators, to cite the most potent examples, are now in detention as they undergo trial on the charge or on the charge of plunder. May just state for the record, we only have 24 senators for the 100 million population. It is no surprise then that we have a more efficient, better motivated, and better performing bureaucracy whose services yield true benefits. Infrastructure costs less and there is far more of it built with better quality. 12,184 kilometers of roads have been constructed, rehabilitated, or improved under our watch so far. By cutting red tape and minimizing, if not eliminating, opportunities for collusion, the Public Works Department has saved over 27.79 billion pesos, which can then be used to implement the next phases of these projects. Today, government is multiplying the benefits that each peso can bring to the Filipino people. Taxes have not been raised, except for those products society discourages, such as alcohol and tobacco. Government-owned corporations, where cronies used to be put out to pasture, no longer lose money while paying lavish bonuses to themselves. A rational, results-driven approach to budgeting has vastly reduced waste and corruption while freeing up funds. We have more than doubled spending on infrastructure, expanded social services, and yet we have halved the deficit. The world, taking notice of our efforts, has helped in this regard. Under our watch, the Philippines has received positive credit ratings actions 20 times with Fitch, Standard & Poor's, and Moody's ranking the country now investment grade for the first time in our history. These ratings upgrades come at a time when ratings agencies themselves have been more conservative in their evaluations because they have come under greater scrutiny after the global economic crisis. This has allowed us to retire old debt, obtain better terms for new debt, and demonstrate to the world that the Philippines is a safe and worthwhile place in which to do business. Last year, our economy grew 7.2%, 
In the second quarter of this year, our 6.4% GDP growth was one of the highest in our region. Most important of all, coming the first semester, co sorry, comparing the first semester in 2012 to the same period in 2013, 2.5 million Filipinos have been lifted above the poverty line. We continue to make massive investments into the people and for the people, not only to ensure that more Filipinos surpass the poverty line, but also to ensure that those who have crossed the poverty line will never fall below it again. Prosperity requires peace and stability within our own borders and in our part of the world. And so the third and fourth cases I will share with you today involve my decision to meet a man who had long rebelled against the government and our efforts to find, a, to find a path to peace in the face of competing claims on the South China Sea. Conflict between Filipino Muslims and the central government has torn Mindanao, our southernmost island group for over 40 years. In August of 2011, in an effort to engender trust and revitalize the stalled negotiations, I embarked on what was then a secret trip to Japan to meet the leaders of these rebels. At the time, there were those who warned me of the poten potential political risk involved in such a move, especially if failure were to arise from the dialogue. The question for me, however, was not one of political calculus. Rather, it was one of personal risk versus national gain. There I was with a chance to advance the country along the path to peace. I knew it was not something I could let slip through my fingers. Conflict had been decades long. The negotiators were belligerents at certain times. Both sides had committed atrocities. Both sides had failed dreams and aspirations. Hence, we needed to rekindle trust. To do so, we had to put ourselves in each other's shoes. Individuals goal, individual goals had no place on the table. The objective was not to gain an advantage over the other party, but to create a win-win situation for all involved. Our dialogue proved that we agreed on a vital point, that our Moro brothers and sisters sought and deserved a push for genuine, genuine structural reform to ensure inclusive development. To achieve this would achieve what all desired, which was lasting peace. We are, we are well on our way towards the goal. Peace negotiations have been success successfully concluded with surveys showing overwhelming support amongst our publics. Before I left the Philippines for this extended trip, my administration submitted a draft law to Congress, which hopes to achieve our collective dreams of fairness and inclusiveness in Muslim Mindanao. The task before us, to ensure that those who have been long neglected are empowered to reap the gains of equitable progress. If trust and long-term thinking can usher in peace in Mindanao, my final example to you is that there is a similar way forward in reducing tensions in the South China Sea. Nations in the region have asserted competing claims to this area, which has for millennia been part of the way of life for our seafaring ancestors. The question we face, will the consensus of the international community as embodied by laws such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas be upheld in resolving these claims? All signatories to the UNCLOS have bound themselves to the equitable delineation of maritime entitlements. It grants us equal rights and also equal obligations. As a founding member of the United Nations, we believe that its governance such as UNCLOS and institutions such as the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea provides the most rational, just, and respectful mechanism for countries to find harmony, despite their differences. This has informed our decision to advance two tracks of action in addressing disputes in the sea, which is known by many names in our part of the world. First, to continue calling for the formulation of a binding code of conduct for the South China Sea. Second, arbitration to clarify the maritime entitlements for all countries concerned. International law allows for a dignified and sustainable resolution to competing claims, as demonstrated by the recently concluded Bay of Bengal Maritime Boundary Arbitration. These four case studies illustrate how the adherence to our bedrock principles of integrity, inclusiveness, and justice, based on the rule of law, have taken our country from one triumph to the next. Some might be wondering, how did we get where we are now? Our country is not rich after all, and coming to the presidency, I inherited many problems which early on seemed insurmountable. The transformation came about because we asked, why not? We got here by refusing to give up and by always asking, why settle for or endure the status quo when we can change it? Our experience has taken, 
us from a party that not too long ago was labeled as impractical do-gooders to an administration that few in the opposition dare attack publicly for fear of a backlash from all those who have benefited from our programs. After all, attacking our reform agenda would mean attacking the very people whose votes they were courting. Today, even the political opposition grants that we have made tremendous progress, which the Filipino people, of course, have seen for themselves. In the 2013 senatorial elections, the candidates we recommended to our people won nine out of 12 seats. In fact, we won nine out of the top 10 positions with the opposition's highest candidate winning fifth and the rest hanging on to the bottom two places. This is not to say that everyone in our country is willing to traverse the straight path with us. There is a saying about Philippine politics. There are only two kinds of candidates, those who won and those who were cheated. I should note that, <coughs> excuse me, that those who thought they were cheated were free to file cases before our senator, Senate Electoral Tribunal, but none were filed. As Robert F. Kennedy once said, and may I quote, one-fifth of the people are against everything all the time, close quote. In public service, you will be criticized for what you did, for what you did not do, and even for what you are about to do or not do. Do something right, and there are those who will say it is the least that is, is expected. And yet, we forge on. Because we give up, or to give up, would mean allowing the shameless and unscrupulous to have free reign over the fate of everyone else. My administration's mandate lasts six years, and I am determined to make the most of it. Our challenge today is to make the gains even greater, and to ensure that the, the transformation becomes an enduring mainstream of justice and inclusiveness. It is my hope that our experiences will motivate those like you from the other side of the world to be influencers, who in turn will inspire the communities and institutions with whom you will interact. Benjamin Houston Brown, who was the program director of the Center for International Affairs during my father's fellowship in Harvard, once paid the tribute to my father by quoting the philosopher Henry Bergson. Dr. Brown said, my father lived up to Bergson's challenge to the young, to think like men of action and act like men of thought. In this more inclusive age, every person of goodwill has it within themselves to do the same. All you here are presented with the same opportunity to maximize the positive transformation in society. You can dream and change the problematic status quo or succumb and merely bend in whatever direction the wind may be blowing. Men and women from all walks of life and faiths in the Philippines have taken up Bergson's challenge and are making what was once impossible possible. The Kennedy School of Government has sharpened the skills of some of them, including four current members of my cabinet, the Budget Secretary, Butchabad, the Social Welfare Secretary, Dicky Suleiman, Presidential Assistant on Food Security, Kiko Pangilinan, and the Presidential Management Staff Secretary, Julia Bat. Julia is part of today's delegation. And also, the CEO of our Basis Conversion Development Authority, Arnel Casanova, Jesse Robredo, former Secretary of the Interior and Local Government and a leading light in a reform agenda, and whom we lost too soon, was also one of your fellows. Despite the difficulties of public service, they all dream and dare to shape their why nots into reality. John F. Kennedy dreamed bigger and acted on it. My father laid down his life and in so doing ignited the movement that toppled the dictatorship. My mother devoted her life to ensuring the democracy we had reclaimed would never be taken away. All of them were faced with daunting tasks and all of them dared, risked, and acted. This is my message to all. Like JFK, Ninoy and Cory, each one has the capacity to dream, to die, to live, to fight, to stand for something, to ask why not when the challenges seem insurmountable. Thus can we transform the world for the better. Thank you for your kind attention.
The President has kindly agreed to take questions. We have four microphones located here, one, at e one here, one right up here, another one here, and another one here. Now, I'd like to remind you the characteristics of a good question here at the Kennedy School. First, <clears throat> you identify yourself. Second, you have a short phrase with one idea. And third, you end with a question mark. So with those things in mind, I will start right over here. Uh, it's on, just talk. Hello? Okay, Manga uh, Manga people, Uncle Pussy Charlie. I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer from the Philippines. Oh, so I'm very you. honored to be in your presence. Um, I worked on education in the Philippines. I just wanted to hear from you, what are your perspectives on the education of out-of-school youth and the role of the alternative learning system in the overall agenda for education in the Philippines? When I, when I was briefed about the alternative learning system, this is basically a program um, to educate our migrant communities, meaning um, indigenous peoples for once, no? do not have acts or are not situated in a particular geographical location, they keep on moving. We have teachers embedded with them so, so that education is not stifled and is continued. Now, for the out-of-school youth, that is one of um, my major considerations. First, we have provided the facilities uh, that they need to stay in school. We are incentivizing the same. The conditional cash transfer program as the principal uh, condition is that children should be kept in school, not just on the elementary level, but also on the secondary level. We have expanded the program this year to cover the secondary level. We are hoping that our tech box sector, TESDA, is manages programs within the high school environment to afford them a marketable skill, even if they were just to finish um, the high school level. So again, um, it's not just a request. We try to incentivize the same, and we do want to provide uh, successful results to motivate the others to continue being in school. The ultimate aim is empowerment of everybody, and one of the principal means is through education. Um, the, sir, the budget for most of our social services have been increased in multiples from the time we started in 2010. Uh, the S Department of Health, for instance, has had something like a threefold increase of their budget from the 2010 levels, precisely to shield our population from catastrophic illnesses that will devastate it. Thank you. Salamat po. Salamat. Your CBI school is research. No, it cannot. No, it cannot, please. If you want to ask a question, come to one of the microphones. Thank you very much. Thank you. No. It's very simple rules here. We listen to the speaker and we ask questions in an orderly manner. If you have, just please come down here. Right over here. Mr. President, my name is Rivan Royono from Indonesia. I think it's fair to say that both our countries are still haunted by ghosts of the past. I, I really want to know what your take on um, balancing um, reconciliation with past authoritarian regime with transitional justice and what's your take on what I perceive to be a longing on the part of a significant percent of our populace to go back to the good old stable days of dictatorship. Thanks. N not in the Philippines, sir. Well, in Indonesia, <laughs> what do you think about what do you think about Indonesia? Then? And even in Indonesia, um, <laughs> to be honest with you, in Indonesia, when I when I talk to President Kidona, and especially the initial dialogue, when I have problems confronted by 100 million Filipinos. I look at him and look at him as a, a role model because he has to contend with uh, problems affecting 250 million Indonesians. So whatever I have, he normally has double in terms of problems. But having said that, um, a, dicta a dictatorship can never be uh, a good solution. The person, no matter how good, no good intention, how thoroughly prepared, will, uh, will have an absence of a check and balance. And again, a man is an imperfect being. So his good will be um, will happen right away, and his bad will be exacerbated. That goes with the territory. Okay, um, reconciliation. In currently, we have a, a law that is being um, implemented, which is uh, called the Human Rights Compensation Bill, uh, and it talks about first and most importantly recognition that the state that should have nurtured and protected its citizens was at one point its oppressors, and um, after that there is an award for uh, well. Um, there is an award for recognition of, say, of the same, so that there is, uh, in a sense, compensation for what was inflicted upon our people. Now, uh, the end result of this also will be uh, putting on the record individual uh, um, accounts of what rights they had that were violated 
during our dark, dark phase of martial law. The end point being, we learned the lesson so that we do not have a situation that repeats itself, that really brought our country to, you know, to the depths that it had entered into. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right up over here. Hi, my name is Marvin Bionat. I'm from uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm also a registered uh, overseas uh, Filipino voter, so very interested in Thank Filipino you. affairs. Um, my question is about inclusive growth. Um, compared to our Asian neighbors, the um, poverty rate in the Philippines is still kind of high. I mean, we're, we're at like 25% or so. Uh, and that's very high compared to uh, our neighbors where poverty rate is in the uh, single digits. And also in terms of unemployment, uh, when you started it was like 6.9 and it's still around, still close to, s to seven, maybe 6.7. Uh, but that's still very high compared to our neighbors uh, where unemployment is around four or under. Um, so my question is, despite all the good gains, and you should get credit for all the uh, economic gains that we have achieved, uh, what, uh, is there anything new or anything innovative that you're doing to make growth and economic progress more inclusive? I did mention one, that we are expanding that conditional cash transfer program and the incentive scheme to the high school level. Um, if you have uh, noticed in the speech, for instance, the tech box sector, which started out with a 28.5 placement rate, is now averaging 68.5%. And in particular categories, it reaches up to 91 and 93%. Um, perhaps I can just um, differentiate from what we had to what we, what we had to what we now have. Okay, um, my predecessor, for instance, claimed that there was no shortages of classrooms. And what was the solution? You had three shifts of, that were utilized in the same classroom. The eight hour day became four hour periods. Now some of our youngsters were going home very late at night just to be able to say that there was no classroom shortage. We inherited that backlog of 66,800 classrooms. The budget cannot support more than 8,000 construction per year. I get a six year term. I produce 48,000, or the government produces 48,000. We still leave it with a deficit where children cannot go to, cannot have the right facilities. That backlog has been eliminated on the third year. We are now actually building for the expanded K-12 to program. Now, that did, uh, the numbers are still high, one would want full employment. Um, but where were we compared to where we are now? Again, there's a, a figure of 1.6 million new jobs, net new jobs in a period only between um, 2013 and 14, 2012, 13. Sorry? Uh, July 2013 compared to July 2014 figures is again net new jobs of 1.6 million. So we cannot get jobs when you have unskilled people, hence uh, all of the investments again in TESDA, uh, CHED uh, in coordination with industry, to seek what they need so that there are jobs that are waiting for our citizens when they get in. Now, part of the problem, and I think you will have to give me a little allowance, people were chasing for careers that were supposed to be hot when they entered college, only to find out that they were over, um, over people by the time they graduated. You know of tragedies wherein people took two courses only to find out that they were repeating the same mistake, chasing after jobs that were not existent. So we inherited that backlog. We are trying to retrain that population. And we are doing all of this while operating under, under a deficit and with practically no resources when we started. Just, just a quick um, question. Please, Mr. I'm President. sorry. Just oh, okay. one, one for customer. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> right over here. Magandang gabi po. Um, good, good evening. My name is Carlino Mark Natividad, and I'm a junior here at Harvard College and co-president of the Harvard Philippine Forum. Um, on behalf of the Harvard Philippine Forum, we actually wanted to present you as Harvard <laughs> Senior <laughs> Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have one. <laughs> Thanks. And my question is, with regards to the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, the EDCA, how do you see this enhancing the role of the Philippines in the region, and how do you see this in America going forward? Well, we have a mutual defense treaty with America dating to the 1950s. But to a large degree, the, um, the operationalization of the same leaves a lot to be desired. Now, um, a lot of times when they're confronted with a new issue, there are so many dialogues to happen, uh, that need to happen, to clarify exactly what each other's roles are. So as far as the Philippines is concerned, uh, the enhanced cooperation means that we will have access to all of this 21st technology. 
and if not just to possess it, but at least to be able to understand and utilize the same. Um, with the end point being that we get to manage situations a lot better. And that, um, again, the roles of the respective partners are more clearly defined, leading hopefully no, to joint cooperation that enhances stability within the region. Thank you. Let me just say, people that are lined up long lines, there's no one behind that microphone, so you might want to spread yourself out since I just go around. Right over here. Hello, Mr. President. Um, my name is Mary Brooks, and I'm a sophomore at the college. As you mentioned, um, approximately 10% of the Filipino population currently lives abroad. So my question for you is, what has been the relation of the state to those populations abroad? And what effects, beyond, of course, attempts to create new jobs, has this their presence abroad had upon the economy and upon government policy? Well, uh, the positive effect of uh, all of this population abroad, this <coughs> remittances, have really provide quite a huge source of hard currency. Of course, the unwritten risk is that there are, um, especially for families that have both parents outside of the country, having their children being raised by relatives, normally grandparents, there might be societal um, costs that will be borne out by not strengthening the nuclear family. Okay. Um, the ultimate goal for our government is that if you choose to work abroad, it, then that is the operative word you, you chose, rather than you were forced because of a want of opportunities in the Philippines. So um, the immediate things that we had to do you know, were to fi find or identify what we call the low-lying fruits, what um, investments can be made, or what, the, what incentives can be made to have investments that have positive results for our people right away. Let me give you one example. One of the vocal areas uh, or sectors of our economy that we are really developing is tourism. We believe that in tourism, we don't have to be too lettered to be able to participate at various levels of it. So um, in support of that, I hopefully you've uh, managed to come across our marketing campaign about it's more fun in the Philippines. But more importantly, we're developing the infrastructure that supports that particular industry. Roads to make tourism destinations that much more accessible. Uh, pocket open skies, which means that the national capital region is the only area where our entries are still restricted. No? But the rest of the country is open. We're uh, building or improving about eight major airports to, to sustain uh, the momentum that's happening. And the results are, by this year, we'll be from three million tourists, foreign tourist arrivals, we'll be doing about five, which means uh, we seem to be on target to hit the 10 million bracket by 2016. In terms of domestic tourism, the figure of 35 million domestic tourists by 2016 was surpassed in 2012 by, I think, it became 36 million domestic tourists. We think we will have um, 56 million domestic tourists by 2016. And you go back, you, know, you preserve the tourist sites, you empower everybody um, upstream and downstream of the tourism industry. Um, you, of course, you have a you have a good marketing campaign to, to make people aware that such things exist in the Philippines. And that is, uh, again, uh, an industry low-lying because it redounds to immediate benefits for people. Of course, uh, the other um, interventions were agriculture and infrastructure, um, both as a um, provider for work for our people and also for the induced investments that infrastructure will bring in, uh, food security for agriculture and improved um, uh, production are, are the penultimate goals. And um, again, um, the end point being empower the people, provide more and more opportunities so that this growth becomes more and more inclusive. Yeah, at the end of the day, with any decision we make, uh, we ask, you know, how does this improve the lot of our countrymen? Thank you. Right up here. Magandang uh, gabi po. My name is Alex Ortiza. I'm a member of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard, and I'm from San Jose, California. Uh, President Aquino, uh, now that you're nearing the end of your term, who do you consider possible successors in upholding an honest Philippine national government? And what would you say to your critics who say, while you're committed to honesty, some of your allies are not? Well, the courts are open. <laughs> if they think that I have dishonest people around me, then all they have to do is file an uh, appropriate case. So, uh, the Ombudsman in particular, I think, even investigates instances where complaints are unsigned or anonymous, precisely to ferret out those who are not uh, treading the correct path. No. So as to naming who 
who I think would be a good successor. I really believe we have a lot of uh, material in the country, but if I were to mention them now, then uh, I'm sure you can <laughs> you can imagine uh, the repercussions back home as to media friends. <laughs> <laughs> and um, per perhaps, as I keep saying, now is not the time. I still have about a year and nine months to go. And if we are concentrated, on, but if we are all concentrated on just the next on the next elections rather than doing the things that we have to do now, you know, we really shouldn't allow the, the the distraction of the election to interfere with our obligations to our people. Now. When I left Manila, there was a a typhoon that was um, uh, affecting our weather. Uh, my own volcano is starting to be restive, and there was a second typhoon whilst I'm still. Uh, not back home. So I think those have to be attended rather than jockeying for position in 2016. Thank you. Right up here. Hi, Mr. Aquino. Thank you so much for coming to Harvard and give us a lecture. So my name is Ko Ching, and I'm from School of Public Health. So um, I'm really inspired by your story and your father's story of fighting against dictatorship. But my question is about the, China, um, the South China Sea dispute. Uh, so. Um, in China, both the government and the people believe that the Philippines is behaving more like a surrogate of the United States to contain the rise of China. And uh, what's your take on that? And in your speech, you mentioned about why not. So I was wondering, instead of confronting Chinese government and uh, play the game of the United States of containing China, China's rise, why not you know, cooperate with Chinese government or talk with them? Like, proactively to settle down those issue or simply put those issue aside and um, and uh, um, develop those islands as a tourism destiny or oil field exploration because I believe there is more synergy between China and United States uh, between Philippines and China I think we've got the question okay thank you thank you so uh, and thank you for the question um, cooperate with China. We, we believe in it's a peaceful rise. Um, we'd like to, we, in the start of the dispute, we did mention there can be no prosperity if it is not inclusive. Um, and prosperity can only happen in an environment of stability. Okay, having said that, in 2011, I had the state visit of the People's Republic of China, wherein we pointed out to them that the Philippine, Philippine corporations invested something like $2.5 billion in China. China has, uh, had invested at that point in time $600 million in the Philippine economy. We sent something like 800,000 tourists their way. They send us 200,000. Okay. Now, um, so the, the relationship is very, very beneficial to, to China, and we also benefit from the same. Now, what is the dispute? The dispute centers on the so-called nine-dash line. And um, why do not talk to China? We keep talking to China. When we were asked not to escalate, uh, the dispute so that uh, uh, the respective constituencies, you know, the publics will not be have inflamed passions. We try to de-escalate the situation. We, I think, we have, we've never discussed, uh, for instance, public, and it's the government, as I ever said, that in our issue in the Scarborough Shoal, wherein we, it, Scarborough Shoal we maintain is within our 200 mile exclusive economic zone. And um, there were fishermen that were spotted eventually from China, or were discovered to be from China, they were capturing species listed in the treaty called CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species. So I understand they're also signatories to the same. They also should not be catching it. And unfortunately, uh, certain agencies of the Chinese government prevented our law enforcement agencies from effecting uh, detention so that they could be uh, uh, processed under the laws uh, on poaching. Now, uh, do we, we, we keep talking to them. The proposed, their proposals never change, which is let's have bilateral uh, discussions on the matter. In the Spratly's chain alone, there are four countries, <coughs> excuse me, there are four countries in ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, no, who are claimants. You add China and Taiwan, so you have six countries. Six countries with, um, who have conflicting claims poses a multilateral problem, I think you will agree. So how can a bilateral agreement between two of the six bind the other four? So there's no stability in the same. All we're saying is there was a dialogue um, in 2002 between ASEAN and China that, that tried to come up with a code of conduct on the South China Sea. That they failed, they came up with a declaration of conduct, which is a set of principles to guide, but 
not a binding set of rules and regulations. In 2012, we reiterated, all of us are saying we want to conform to international law, then why shouldn't we adhere to what is stipulated in UNCLOS and then at the same time, you know, finish the code of conduct that everybody says they want. And at the end of the day, we are all, we, we all know our entitlements and our obligations and how we're supposed to deal with each other. So one last point, the nine dash line, again, you cannot identify a position with dashes. It has to be points connected to other points. So when you actually plot where these dashes are, nobody I think can categorically state that they correspond to a particular longitude and latitude. Now we are defending our rights. Our constitution tells me that I cannot give up our sovereignty. I have no leeway in that matter. We don't want trouble with anybody. We want to spend in the classic argument in economics of guns versus butter. We really want to devote all our resources to butter. But at the same time, you know, we, we have to contend with the realities that, they, uh, that exist on the ground. And if we don't fight for our rights, we don't expect anybody else to fight for them. So I hope that is recognized that if the situations were reversed, if, they were the big, if we were the big economic powers with the big military power, then they would ask us to respect the rights. So that's the only thing we're asking. Let's respect each other's rights. Let's uh, do right by each other and be fair with each other. And that is the basis for stability for all. Thank you. Sure. Right here. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Good evening. My name is uh, David Rose. I'm a first year master in public policy here at the Kennedy School. And in a former life, I was an officer in the US Navy. And in November, I was actually on the ground in Leyte providing support to the brave soldiers of the Philippine Army to provide humanitarian assistment, assistance to the people that were impacted by the typhoon. Now, I saw firsthand the benefits of our historic friendship between the US and the Philippines. And my question is, what is your long-term vision for ways in which the US and the Philippines can work together to overcome kind of the troubles that we had in the 90s when we had to withdraw from Subic Bay and Clark Base? And how do you think we can move forward with our relationship in well, the long term? Well, your former ambassador actually said that uh, there is no need to revision, uh, to revisit where we were, or is there is the American intention to go back to where it was? Now, we start off from, uh, why do we have a strategic partnership with America? It starts out with the shame, uh, sorry, the shared uh, values, no, the shared um, aspirations, uh, even a shared system of governance. So um, proceeding from that, and as to where we want to go to, seems to be the natural course for both our countries. So there are benefits uh, of this relationship with each other. Now. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, government goes where its people wants it to go. And a lot of surveys in our country state that the overwhelming majority of our people look kindly upon America, do not dwell on instances where we had our issues with each other, and uh, see in America the best chance you know, for maintaining the, the, um, the way of life that we, are, we want and we are accustomed to. So again, um, I don't think um, the way it was explained to me by various officials of your government, uh, is there a need uh, for you to maintain bases within the Philippines? But the presence of the same, the sharing of intelligence, for instance, uh, sharing of training facilities, uh, joint uh, exercises, suffices to make uh, the, um, the defense treaty more than the paper it's worth, uh, more, more worthy than the paper it's written on. I will have to excuse myself for if sometimes I pause. This is, I think, close to my 80th engagement from the time I left uh, the country. <laughs> Even my writers are kind of um, suffering a little fatigue and they're a lot younger than me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right over here. Good evening, Mr. President. Good my evening. name is Shintan Rufauzia. I'm a Harvard Law student from Indonesia. Let me first say that I admire the Philippines' commitment on the protection of rights of your indigenous people through the enactment of IPRA. My question would be, what is your vision and uh, Philippines' plan to enhance the protection of rights of the indigenous people following national and international critics on the protection of rights of the indigenous people? Thank you. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, growth has to be inclusive and, inclu and empowerment is the key to it. Now, uh, we discussed uh, the alternative learning systems. You know. In fact, um, there was a recent video that was shown to me of somebody who had discovered her rights under IPRA precisely because of the alternative learning system. So um, we don't wait 
you know, in, in that particular setup. We don't wait for them to situate themselves in a community that they can go to school every day. In our Department of Education has thought fit to find volunteers who are willing to join them as they, they have their nomadic way of life to be able to continuously provide um, the education set up for all of the children. Now, um, look at um, the Bangsamoro Basic Law that is proposed before Congress. There is a 10% uh, reserve allocation for both indi the indigenous and women's uh, groups uh, to compose 10% uh, again of the parliament that's going to be set up under this uh, particular law. Again, to ensure that um, they they will have that particular voice. The basic law also takes into cognizance their dispute mechanisms as part and parcel of our legal system in terms of resolving all of these disputes. And, and, and the list goes on and on. But um, on the other side, there has to be also um, perhaps a rethinking of the issue of uh, an ancestral domain. No? Um, sometimes the agencies, when they tra try to map out uh, which is part of the ancestral domain and which is not, uh, create overlapping maps that leads to confusion by every party concerned and a diminution of the ability of the state to protect the rights, especially of indigenous people. So that is uh, presently being corrected. Thank you. Thank uh, you. My name is Genevieve Quitario, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of History here. And um, I'll keep my question brief. So I'm just curious uh, about the fate of the repro uh, reproductive health law and whether the Philippines will even have a real family planning bill given the opposition of the Catholic cur clergy. And I wanted to know what you think about that and um, what yes. you hope for the future for this bill. Okay, the bill has passed. It's actually law. It was challenged in the Supreme Court. Yeah. And I, th I read in today's, I, have, I get a series of uh, news capsules from, from back home. And the uh, Department of Health and was already announcing specific activities in implementation of the Republic, uh, sorry, reproductive health law. Now the major issue is we have a population of uh, 100 million now. When I started into office, uh, population growth rate was something like two percent, which means about uh, roughly about uh, now two million you know, every year new new Filipinos. So, the, the in from our perspective, the bill's uh, merit primarily said. Parents have reminded parents you have responsibilities towards your children, and we will respect your conscience, what your what your faith and your belief uh, says about how you are to plan your family. We will support you and not dictate to you, and that has been embodied uh, in in this law, which we are now going to implement. Thank you. Thank you. Right up here. So, sorry, not going to implement. We are now implementing. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, kamusta po? My name is Vanessa De Gia. I am a student at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm wondering what federal policies or efforts are being made specifically for Filipino Americans to come home to the motherland and serve. Well, um, hey, well for instance, in, you know, in education, perhaps I can use that as an example. Sure. No? Um, we expanded uh, our basic education setup from a 10-year program to, in effect, uh, we call it the K to 12. So it's K plus 12 years to make it up to par with international standards and give our, our youth uh, the ability to imbibe all of the knowledge that they will need to succeed in this world. That has opened up uh, so many positions in our teaching profession you know, that have to be filled up. So as a result of that, there are about 300 already who have gone as o OFW and worked in professions other than teaching, who have finished their certifications and are just finishing the contracts that they have currently before joining our Department of Education as teachers, especially in uh, the K-12 program, expansion program. Now, um, in when we're trying to recover our engineers, our scientists, et cetera, so uh, it's, too, it's multifaceted scholarships for uh, going back, well, scholarships uh, after service uh, to the state. Um, we're trying to get the laboratories, the advanced laboratories, uh, and other facilities that they need that prompted them to leave, uh, established in the Philippines, tying up with uh, a lot of uh, prestigious universities and colleges so that they can continue their basic research at home rather than go abroad. And, um, and the list goes on and on. I'm sorry, I can't recall all of the details at this time. Thank you. Right down over here. Hello. Hello. My name is Frank Ferzo. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Design here. So we should talk because this question is very similar. 
but um, I'm researching uh, the link between diasporas and development, and where one question um, asked about the Filipino citizens working abroad, I was wondering how you envision actively engaging the millions of Filipino, uh, people of Filipino descent who are citizens of other countries. Actively engage, I'm sorry, don't get the question, sir. Uh, how do you envision engaging people who identify as Filipino but are not Filipino citizens, people who want to play okay. an active role in the development of the country? Well, number one, for instance, in America, I keep reminding the Filipino communities here, or those who trace their descent, um, it really would be helpful if uh, we could get united. <laughs> if the three and a half million that we do have here acted as one rather than <laughs> separate entities. Um, in various other communities across the world, our Department of Foreign Affairs is the lead agency assisted by uh, the Labor Department, but primarily DFA organizes all our communities to be helpful towards one another. Um, and at the end of the day, they are also the principal uh, means, you know, working through various organizations to extol the opportunities that are existing already back home. Now, um, we do seriously engage uh, all of our communities, building up their organizations so that uh, their, their rights are adequately protected and the opportunities are, are announced to one and all. But again, uh, currently, the emphasis is growing our economy, the increasing the opportunities uh, to be had back home to prevent even more of the diaspora from happening. Okay. We have time for just three more questions. Right here's the first. Magandang hapo, Presidente. Uh, maraming salamat pagdating nyo. Ako po ay si Frank Silosa. Ako po ay organizer dito sa Boston. Uh, my question to you is, uh, when you announce your candidacy, we, some of us in, uh, in America, campaign for Neumar because we believe and uh, we, we hope that uh, by the reputation of your mom and dad, we'll be able to have a president who is reputable and clean and honest. So you didn't disappoint us. Thank you. Thank you. My question to you is, uh, uh, this proudly, China is claiming on their nine, nine dust line that it belongs to them uh, since uh, 1200, I think. If we subscribe to that, uh, to that logic, Italy can, uh, can claim Germany and, and France because in the early years, they were part of the Roman Empire. And that's, that's no basis to claim a particular land Bajo de is only 125 miles from the Philippines that our fishermen had been fishing there for hundreds of years. And it's 600 miles from China. My question to you is, the geodetic survey said that uh, we have at least 40 billion barrels of oil underneath that land, enough to, uh, to surpass Kuwait. With millions of people uh, toiling in the foreign lands and being abused by the Middle Eastern ammo and, and uh, their masters. My question to you is, are you bringing the question of uh, the dispute with UNCLOS in the United Nations when you speak tomorrow? Because I think that's the only way we can put pressure to the Chinese government to, to bring it, to get together because we will never be able to fight China with those, their armaments. Would you? Yes. So the topic tomorrow is uh, more on global climate change rather than uh, these territorial di disputes. And we are actually involved already in arbitral proceedings before the International Tribunal on the Law of the Seas, which is, uh, in effect, um, a UN body through UNCLOS. It, uh, it is the arm that uh, settles disputes um, and to interpret the provisions of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. And uh, I think uh, that is already doing what you are suggesting, sir. Thank you. Right here, and this will be the last question over there. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. President. Hello. My name is Ida. I'm a second year graduate student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, we're honored to have you here. Uh, there is a perception that there's a, that in the Philippines, there's a strong political dynasties at the local and the national level. So do you think that the Philippines will benefit more from having less political dynasties? And if so, how can elections be more inclusive of people who do not come from political dynasties? Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, um, there is uh, already measures and before Congress, no, and, uh, and I have vowed to, to pass the anti-dynasty law um, in furtherance of the Constitution. And uh, to be honest with you, it's, um, 
But perhaps uh, when our, the framers of our Constitution put that provision in, uh, the definition of the problem was not um, as well done as could have been done. For instance, um, you know that our society values uh, reputation, uh, having a good name, etc. So if you are uh, assuming no, uh, there were free and open elections and they were credible, then you had somebody who had the same surname win, then perhaps it is a testament to the the person who came beforehand. But in this particular case, and not because I'm also a, somewhat of a politician, it seems that um, the rights for everybody are universal except for politicians. No? If you're a politician, you shouldn't be allowed uh, an opportunity for public office. If you're a politician, your life should not just be an open book, it should also be examined on the subatomic level. If you're a politician, you're uh, expected to <laughs> take all of the criticism and keep on smiling. No. But anyway, having said that, um, <laughs> there are <laughs> instances when economic, political, and sometimes even judicial power are in the hands of a particular family where the playing field no, is no longer open. And um, some rights may have to be sacrificed. For instance, when you talk about freedom of speech, it's not absolute, you can't, you know, can't say fire in this hall. So, Perhaps I'm sure a lot of politicians would say, okay, to forestall the possibility that there will be abusive situations, then perhaps no. we, we should make sure that uh, at some point in time, perhaps after the term limits, then there is a whole new set who will be bringing in ideas that hopefully will build upon that which was already developed. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you know, new blood does bring new ideas, new methodologies, new energies that perhaps can improve on that which was already set. Last question right up here. Yes, sir. Gabi po. Uh, Mr. President, Joseph Bayana from uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, using the accumulated knowledge of, of mankind coming from the 150 million volumes of uh, the Library of Congress, um, from Adam Smith to Ricardo to all the Nobel Peace Prize uh, economics winners, I just wanted to ask, why are you purchasing arms from Canada, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and the United States, knowing that in the United States and all these other countries, security and defense is an industry. It creates jobs. It expands the economy. Loudoun County, Virginia, it's a beautiful place. But why would you buy arms knowing that it does not create jobs, nor does it expand the economy of the Philippines? Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are we buying a lot of arms or most of it arms, no? Perhaps in absolute numbers, we're buying rifles for our armed forces to the tune of about 50,000. We have a 250,000 security sector. They have weapons that are uh, uh, Vietnam era vintage, and that's not the tail end of the Vietnam War era. That's the earlier part. Okay. We have ships, 132, most of them World War II, if not all of them. No, I can't say all of them. There are like five or so. We have a 36,000 kilometer coastline. No, and you're asking this, uh, what, 70-year-old, 80-year-old ships to, to do the protection. We need interconnectivity between our islands, no, 7,100 of them. We need the choppers and the aircraft to begin the relief goods. No, um, before you ask, no, 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 let me finish. Oh, no, no, sir, no, sir, no. sir I, I think I listened no, to you. With, with all due respect. No, no. please, please, come on. I gave you a chance. <laughs> please, 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 just let the president answer. We're not here to listen to you. Thank you, please. Please. One question. Same rules as ever. Okay. Thank you. Please, please. We're going to have to ask you to leave. Okay. Thank you. Well, again, uh, you're. You're talking in generalities. At least look at the shopping list and tell us how much of that, how much of the budget has gone into arms, and how much of it is for equipment that we do need to service our people. Mr. Okay. President, I'd like to give you a chance to answer a question that are on many people's minds here, which is many of the people are here are students who would love to be exceptional public leaders. Do you have any words of advice for them of how to do such a thing? I'm still learning myself, but at the end, <laughs> no, but at the end of the day, uh, I start off with a simple premise. No? 
you can get involved or you can be apathetic. When you're apathetic, what happens to you? Then I guess you, shouldn't, you don't have the right to complain. You accepted that others will make the decisions for you. You can, on the other hand, be active and shape that which comes you know, after. And I guess the choice seems to be really, really very simple. And the more people actively working for the common good, you know, translates into getting to where we want to go faster rather than suffering uh, the status quo that doesn't serve mm, the vast majority. So I, I go back, you either, it's always a choice. Uh, don't worry about the uncertainties of the things that come before you. Um, I'm a Catholic, we tend to believe that we are required to do that which we can, and God will take care of that which we cannot. And when I look back at the, the life that we have had to undergo, perhaps if I was given a menu or a list, no? these are the things and the tragedies that will befall you from this point to that. This will be the challenge. I probably would have said, uh, perhaps you can pass that on to the next guy. <laughs> but there really seems to be that plan you know, that, um, that will prepare you for the next step, that will help you overcome. And, and um, again, I, uh, when I went home, I guess I can put it that way, because I'm being asked to address the youth. My father was killed, I was 23 years old. I could have stayed out of the country and said, you know, that country is not worth fighting for, not worth living for. You allowed this tragedy to happen to my dad. You know, it's nothing to you. And, yeah. But the point was, you know, I really couldn't live with myself and say, after all that he had undergone, nothing changed. That was not acceptable. So I, I crossed that particular line and said, you know, I really have to do whatever I can you know, to be able to finish that dream and to make his sacrifice have some meaning. And um, up to this day, you know, his sacrifice, my mother's sacrifice, so many of our people's sacrifice continues to inspire me. Whenever I'm confronted with a very big problem, you know, all I, I need to do is go back and say, look, they had it worse and they overcame. You know, sh should I be complaining that I'm having it a little easier? when I can do more of the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a good evening, and again, my thanks to President Aquino.